All right, so again, we are in John chapter one. We're gonna leave Luke for a little while and we're gonna go into John chapter one because I think that that was a good place for us to land and taking a look at um, the building of the team again in part three in a, in a title. I've titled the message this week just very simply, A Heart Prepared. As this is part three. I'm going to be reading verses 43 down through 51, and then we're going to get into the word. But I want you to be thinking in terms of a couple of things. One, when we learn about this, as we go through here, being introduced to Nathaniel and Philip, what are we going to do with what we actually know? I want you to be thinking along those lines as we unpack this text of Scripture this morning. And then understanding this whole picture of a fig tree. I think it's important for us to understand that because it it helps us to make good sense of what happens with Nathaniel. This whole fig tree picture is a a very Jewish thing where a a man and his fig tree is what you would always hear. It was a place where a, a person could go, a guy could go with a book or a scroll or whatever where he could rest, where he could have reflection and where he could just be very prayerful in in the shade and the covering and the protection of the tree in the heat of the day. And you would find that a lot of people would go at that particular time in the scriptures and they would go there to study, they would go to their reflect, they would go to their pray. It's important for us to remember that as we open up this story as well. And if we're honest with ourselves, it was also a great place for an afternoon nap in the heat of the day. And so all of those things I think we need to keep in mind as we read this scripture and then as we try to understand who Nathaniel is and why it's important for us today. But John records for us, starting in verse 43, that the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's an encourager. Philip said to him, come and see. So Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. That's a quick change of direction, isn't it? Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. There's a lot there in that short passage of scripture. There's a whole bunch that we could tackle. And I wouldn't have thought that in this particular section of scripture that it was gonna be a difficult one for me to work through as I tried to put together what it is we're supposed to tackle. But I discovered I couldn't be more wrong. The more I dug into this, the more it became difficult for me to sort out what it is we're supposed to look at. Because looking at this particular section here in John and the calling of Philip and Nathaniel, in some places in the Bible, Nathaniel is actually called Bartholomew. It's when, that's when it's listed, I think, at the end of Matthew, I believe, is when he says that. But there's a lot for us to look at. Should we tackle and cover this thing here that we see at the end in verse 51 where he talks about Jacob's ladder from the Genesis account where Jacob is somehow wrestling with the Lord and he sees these visions of angels coming and going into heaven? Do we try to tackle that and go down the road and ask ourselves why that's there? Because after all, Jacob was nothing but a liar and a deceiver. So it kind of makes no sense here when we look at this because that's not what Nathaniel was. He tricked his father, Jacob did, into giving him something that didn't belong to him by lying about who he was. So why is that here? We're not gonna unpack that today, but that's food for thought for you. Because Nathaniel, as we see here in this text of scripture, according to Jesus, had no deceit at all in him. And I think that that's something that we need to focus on. It's a comment, by the way, that triggers a confession of faith when Jesus looks at him and says that there is no deceit in you. And that that confession of faith is in somebody in, in, in what apparently was the one good thing that came out of this place of Nazareth. That quick switch, as it were, in direction for Nathaniel as we're trying to figure this out. Do we tackle that particular perspective? That instant comment that he made when Philip said to him, you've got to come see this guy, Jesus of Nazareth. And we all know it well. We can understand rivalries for most of us who have played sports in our life, those of you who do now. I want you to be thinking in terms perhaps of BFA and MVU, Swanton and St. Albans and how it is we take a look at each other and what town it is we come from and how that works itself out. For me, where I grew up, it was Foxborough and Mansfield, that rivalry. Nothing good could come from Mansfield because I was from Foxborough. But... 
people from Mansfield felt the same way about Foxborough. And that was worked out there every Thanksgiving day when we had a football game. No, it didn't matter at all what our records were. As long as we beat Mansfield, we had bragging rights for a year. I mean, you pick it. You think this out as human beings and as sensible people when we look at this. Why would Nathaniel make a comment like that? There's a reason for it. He has a mindset there. You really can't be that good if you're from that town. I mean, you can't be that smart if you graduated, like for me, from Mansfield High, when I take a look at people like that. Can anything good come out of that place? And does anybody here in this room think like that today when we look at the next town over? Keep that in mind as we look at that. Because wherever you're from, you need to pick it. These types of rivalries and these attitudes emerge that we see with Nathaniel. And that is important for us to understand today because it's rooted in history and the human condition. How we prejudge somebody very quickly, how we take a look at someone and assume certain things, nothing has changed at all. You see, Nathaniel hailed from Cana in Galilee. We learn that in John 21 too when he starts listing the disciples. And he says, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, and then he gives us this interesting note. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. And that is just a little bit northeast of Nazareth and apparently a place, it seems to me, as we take a look at this, that had very little love as they took a look at that city. And Nathaniel makes it clear to us. And it's a detail that we don't want to miss as Jesus continues to build his team. It's very interesting to me and it's very helpful to me. Nazareth, archaeologists and historians will tell us as we go and we study that particular place, was home to Roman garrison of soldiers. It was a place where they had settled, stationed in the very quiet backwaters of the very eastern, eastern shores of the Roman Empire. Now soldiers, if anybody understands soldiers, knows that they would probably get very bored in a very quiet backwater town, and soldiers tend to entertain themselves more often than not in less than wholesome ways. And that's part of the issue. That view and that perception affected the whole town and the people's opinion of that town based upon what was going on there. And in Nazareth, that was happening. So the question of what good could come from a place like that tends to make sense if you understand the backstory. And those are issues that we struggle with if we pull it forward into 2022. How is it we categorize the people in our lives? That's why I talked about our rivalries and how it is we look at things. How do we prejudge them and how do we define them based upon their pedigree? based upon their upbringing, based upon the assumptions that we make based on family history and preconceived notions because that's what we do as human beings. So I reflect back quite often, the older I get, because I'm not as young as I used to be on my time at Foxborough High, and not to make excuses because, to be honest, I was probably not the most scholarly student walking the halls of that school. But fighting the history that I had there of how unstellar my father was in the 60s. I was just carrying that torch forward. The problem was is that some of the teachers that were still there had my dad, and they simply assumed that I was just like him. And they were right, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> simply being his boy sadly put me at a disadvantage because people had preconceived notions so I was behind the eight ball before I ever even walked in some of those classrooms. And again, I didn't help the matter. But coming north to what I called at the time the hinterlands of Vermont, y'all didn't have street signs, you didn't have lights, there's just a lot of things that were weird for me at 17 years old. It provided an opportunity for me that I had never had up to that point. Nobody here knew who I was. Nobody knew who I was. And one of the things that I found amazing that is important, I think, for us to understand is that there is always that one person in our life. For me, it was a teacher who took the risk and looked beyond what was standing or sitting right in front of them. And for me, and reflecting back as I'm trying to put this message together, her name was Mary Lynn Riggs. She was my 10th grade English teacher because I was on my third or fourth tour in the 10th grade, but again, that's for another time. <laughs> at least by way of English. But she was my English teacher at NVU, and she said to me one day after I got an A on my Shakespeare exam, after only being there about a week and a half, yes, Shakespeare, I didn't do very much well, but I did that well. She just smiled at me and said, there's more to you than meets the eye. She was able to look beyond 
a young man carrying a .7 GPA. If you don't think that's possible, I'll show you the report card. (laughs) She was able to look beyond that and looked into what nobody else saw. When I arrived here, that particular grade point average in my attitude didn't give her or anyone else much hope that I knew anything. But you see, assumptions are a dangerous thing, aren't they? That's Nathaniel's problem. They become very dangerous when we make quick decisions, when we make quick judgments. And Nathaniel himself would be challenged very quickly with a simple comment. So I think one of the most important things for us to discover today as we take a look at this text is this confession of faith that comes from Nathaniel. How is it this man makes that leap from nothing good can come out of that place to all of a sudden he is the son of God and the king of Israel? We have to ask ourselves that question. So I wanna ask you a question. Have you ever heard the expression, if you aren't careful, you'll miss heaven by 18 inches? Have you ever heard that? If you haven't, Think it through. I submit this to you that this was perhaps part of Nathaniel's issue. Thus the fig tree. He was a studier. He was a brainiac. He had all of the stuff up here. We see right at the outset of our text this morning that Philip is the one that's next in line and we discover in Acts as well that Philip also is a thinker and a studier. And he's the one that's being added to Jesus' merry little band of disciples. The next day, Jesus decides to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, so there's the connection there. But it's also clear from the text that Philip and Nathaniel are friends. We need to understand that because the first thing that Philip does when he is called and he recognizes who Jesus is, is to find his old friend and to let him know that he has found, or better yet, has someone has found him and let him know who he is. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. See, he doesn't go to him and say, look at he's healing people. He's calling people to himself. He's touched the leper. He's done all these things. Philip says, no, I've found the one that I've studied about. The one who Moses in the law talks about. The one that the prophets talk about. This Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, what we call the Old Testament, For those of you who have your Bibles, all of those books, Philip understood when he met Jesus from his studies, all of that was pointing to this little carpenter from Nazareth. We've found the one that the book tells us about. Doesn't matter what he's done, but we found the one that the book tells us about. We aren't guessing here. We aren't running around based upon how we feel at the moment because this guy's doing cool things. How many of us do that? We get all kinds of good feels on a Tuesday and we start chasing around and thinking all these things and then come Thursday, we're hit by a truck and our feelings are gone and we have no idea that how we've gotten to where we are. Now these guys aren't running around based upon how they feel. Philip is talking about what he knows. What he knows. And that's a good thing but it's also problematic. He knows that Jesus is the one because the book tells us that he is the one. What he is doing validates what the book says. And the book then validates what Jesus is doing. It wasn't happening just in the middle of nowhere. He's telling Nathaniel our histories, all of our stories, and all of our prophets tell us to look for the one who's going to fix all of our problems and to save us. Nathaniel, this is the guy. This is the guy. And John is really careful here to tell us that it is from the Bible that we understand this. Not from the things he was doing, but from the Bible. You want to know who this Jesus is? Go to the book. Our challenge is to think that way too today. That is our challenge. We are encouraged, in fact, by Luke when he records in Acts about the Jewish people who lived in Berea. They didn't believe just because they were told something. They didn't assume that it was right because it was a feel-good story. They actually dug into the scriptures. It says here that the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. They were being thrown out of Thessalonica because there weren't tea parties. They were just hucking rocks at him because they didn't like what he said. So when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue and now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. But here's what they did. They examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They didn't make assumptions. 
Belief happens not simply because of intellectual reasoning and our fat-headed knowledge. That is part of what is needed. No, but we discover from the writer to Hebrews that we have to put it together with something else. That this book, this Bible that we have in front of us is so much more than just words on paper that we can process with our brains. Faith, genuine heart faith and belief is part of the equation as well as how it is we think through the things that we see on the pages of scripture. The book itself in Hebrews tells us that the word of God is living and active. Christine talked about that as she sang this morning and she shared with us that this is more than just words on paper. It's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joint and marrow and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who must give account. This book knows more about me than I know about me. And if I can be honest with myself, it will reveal things to me most of the time that I don't wanna see. And perhaps that's part of Nathaniel's issue. And his response shouldn't be much of a surprise then when he asked the question, can anything at all good come out of Nazareth? Because he was thinking in a different way. Is that an illegitimate question? It's not. So is it then rooted in assumptions and preconceived notions about the town that this Jesus comes from that he really didn't care for? Therefore, nothing good could come out of that town. And the answer to that is yes. For the one who was spoken of, Nathaniel would know, was to be coming from the house in the line of David. Now where is that? Bethlehem, not Nazareth. His mind could not get his heart around the confession that Philip had just made to him because it didn't make sense to him, at least not yet. Thus the question that I've posed to all of us today, do you know how you miss heaven by 18 inches. You miss it this way, by being the brainiac under the fig tree and never getting what you know embedded into what you feel and understand to be true. You need both. We can know the Bible. We can read it every day. And we can even make the statement that it is true and acknowledge it here in our brains that it's true but have our hearts received it by faith? Have we taken it into here? Because it's at that point that what we know and what we understand transforms us from within. And that is done by what we know. And that is a genuine conversion. You see, in our first reading, and that's why I went to Romans, Paul is challenging us there. He's talking about this. He's emphasizing the fact that we need both reason that's head knowledge, and we need faith. That's a heart belief. One is not absent the other in our journey to Jesus. If all you've got is stuff up here in your head, that's all you've got. If all you have is what you feel in here, the first time something goes wrong, you're not gonna be able to stand. You have to have both in order to be secure. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern, that is the understanding, both the heartfelt faith and the brain that's going on here, what is the will of God, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. We can actually understand this stuff. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything? Well, yes. Absolutely something can. Good can come from such a place. You just need to work it out, Nathaniel. I can see it being said right now. Use your head, engage your mind, open your heart. Dump your preconceived notions. Get rid of that. Ask the question, is what Philip's saying true? Don't let your judgment on how it is you see things get in the way of what's really going on in front of you. You have to have both reason and faith in order for the Bible to work. You have to process it that way. The gospel itself actually makes logical sense. The people who say that this book is nothing but a bunch of gibberish, every time I have talked to, at least the ones I've talked to, have never taken the time to open it, to actually read it. But they assume a lot of things. And that gives me the opportunity to have a good conversation. Well, have you actually read what it says? Because you're right, it is weird. 
And it is hard to get our hands around, you see. It makes logical sense. And we can even follow the evidence to the conclusion that it's true. But that doesn't do anything more than give us information. Claude can tell me six ways until the rapture how to drill a well. Eli can then walk me by holding my hand on how to run that machine. And I will cost them millions of dollars because I will break it. <laughs> Doesn't matter what I know. Skill set, not there. That's why I'm in the pulpit. I can't hurt too much here by way of <laughs> drilling well. What do you do with what you know? You see, that's the heart question. That's the challenge that Nathaniel has here in my mind. James tells us that even the demons believe this. They believe the gospel and they shudder. As in James chapter one, they know the truth of who Jesus is. They recognize Jesus for who he is and yet they aren't saved. Not just because they're demons but because they never exercised by faith any kind of transformational belief. They just knew. They knew Jesus was the guy but a grace, faith, heart transformation. Nathaniel is an intellectual under the fig tree studying the scriptures, asking a genuine and honest question and the answer can very well be no, not really, nothing good can come from there and yet here walking down the street looking at Nathaniel comes Jesus, this Jewish carpenter with four fishermen and a tax collector in tow. That doesn't make sense to somebody like Nathaniel, but here they come nonetheless. And then here comes Philip, the little newbie, being dragged along all with him, going, hey, Nathaniel, look at what I've found. And then right behind them, he's got the Pharisees checking everything that Jesus is doing by yelling, look at you healed on a Sabbath, you shouldn't do this, you touched a leper. Can you imagine what's going on in Nathaniel's head? No, I'm not sure nothing can come good from there. The challenge is, is that Jesus didn't fit in the box. And even today, still, Jesus cannot and will not fit into our box. Stop trying to put him in a box. Doesn't work. Because here is the actual challenge that we need to fight through. And I'm moving slow, purposefully so. We are not facing an intellectual dilemma here when it comes to the Bible. We never are. That doesn't mean check your brains at the door. But we are not facing an intellectual dilemma. That's a misunderstanding that we have. We think that accepting Jesus is all about our brains, our rationale, our intellect, as if salvation is ultimately an intellectual question. It's not. Our salvation is a moral decision. It's a moral question. That happens here because of what we understand here. That's how it works. We have to identify our need at the heart level before we will understand Jesus in the way that we're supposed to. There is enough evidence given to us to believe. Therefore, we have to use our brains. We have to engage our minds. But the challenge comes when we ask this question, do I want to believe what is being presented to me? Do I want to acknowledge the truth that is being given to me today? That decision sends it to 18 inches from your head to your heart and the Holy Spirit begins that transformational process inside all of us. And frankly, that is not a lazy person's journey. The Christian life is not an easy life. It's a challenge that we have. It takes effort. It means that we have to die to ourselves Die to our thinking and our rethinking these things through. Nathaniel had to do all these things. We don't have it recorded for us, but these things had to happen. Setting aside our preconceived notions for the truth of God's word. Allow it, as the writer to the Hebrews says to us, to divide us spirit, soul, and body, bone and marrow. When we get before the Lord in prayer, ask him to show us what we need to give to him to change us, to conform us, to transform us. That lets it shine into the dark recesses of our being so that we can see that this Jesus is actually a very good thing that has come out of Nazareth, leading to genuine repentance and conversion because Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him 
and said to him, behold, or said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? How do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Very important. The response that comes from Nathaniel at this point raises a couple of questions for me because Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God and you are king of Israel. Number one, what was he studying under that fig tree? What was he being challenged with? And number two, what is he praying and asking God for? that caused him to make that decision that turned him around 180 degrees, whatever it was, Jesus telling him that I saw you under that tree triggered an absolute faith response which transformed Nathaniel's heart and brought him into the fold. He recognized here and here and it traveled that 18 inches. It was a mind ready and his heart was prepared. Chuck Swindoll is beautiful in this when he says this, Nathaniel's heart was thoroughly prepared to receive the truth because he was earnestly studying the scriptures and searching for the Messiah. So once Jesus removed a legitimate obstacle of belief, prejudice, Nathaniel believed at once. Others will prove to be quite the opposite. And this is a painful thing that Swindoll says. The most astounding displays of supernatural power will not move them to believe because they stubbornly choose to reject the truth standing before them. That's a warning in scripture. Any one of us sitting here today, if we are not careful, can be that person. Don't be that person. No matter how much evidence you may have, there are those who simply will not believe. Again, it's not an intellectual question, it's a moral one. That's key. Our decision for Christ is not an intellectual one, it's a moral one. Many struggle with this, sorting out the head knowledge and the heart belief. We have to have both because the Bible is not a fairy tale. We are forced to use our imagination in order that we may believe and convince ourselves that dragons are real. That's not what the Bible's about. Belief, or at least the acknowledgement of truth, always starts where? Here. It has to start in our brains. Paul tells us that in Romans and it can't simply stay something of an exercise in logic and intellect. There's a danger there when that happens which turns believers into Pharisees and it keeps unbelievers from becoming believers. Because there's just things in this Bible that don't make any sense except by faith. There's the emotion that we have, our hearts, which exercises the faith of a child which is to accept the gospel and Jesus is the truth. And this is a challenge for a lot of us here today in a world that doesn't have truth, that doesn't want truth, that wants to believe what it wants to believe. Accepting the gospel in Jesus as the truth, understanding that this man from Nazareth is who he says he is. You see, every person sitting here today, every person within the sound of my voice, every person everywhere on planet Earth needs to exercise both of these things because God has given us both of these things. And it is an absolutely frightening thing to me today in a world of science and reason at just how unhinged we have become from both of those things. We have walked away from any kind of reason, any kind of sensibleness, living almost entirely on subject opinions and our feelings rather than reasoned truth and believable evidence. Some of the things that are believed today as fact and as truth are so obscene and absurd that I don't even know how anyone can get their hands around it. There's not even any evidence on this planet for any of it to make any sense. And yet we're pushing it forward as some sort of truth. No. You see, the Christian faith in one sense is not just about what I believe simply because I want to believe it. The Christian faith is actually true. It is rooted in history, in events that have happened to real people in real places at a specific time. It can be reasoned out and it can be logically believed, but it takes the heart as well because it is both history and mystery at the same time. There are some things that we just have to grab onto by faith. But because of all the evidence that we can reason out with our brains, we can trust that what we have to grab by faith is true. Because everything else holds water. 
The scriptures tell the story of both the history and the mystery of who this Jesus is. It is rooted in the story of the people of Israel. It is rooted in the history of the people of Israel. Moses tells us these things, Nathaniel. The prophets tell us these things. It's in the book. It's in the book. We've found the one. Nathaniel reacts in a way that too many people did then and sadly do today, that very negative and disparaging way before stepping into belief and saving faith because he was challenged by Jesus, throwing it all away without ever even examining it. Don't be that. Don't be that. Jesus leaves us zero wiggle room when it comes to himself. And he gave Nathaniel no space in the kind words that he said, The world has to confront, or more accurately, the world needs to be confronted by this Jesus of Nazareth. Who he was, who he claimed to be. The options to ignore this man are never given to us. They've never been on the table. Neither is the option to think that he was just some cool mystic sage cruising around in his Birkenstocks teaching people how to be a better person and do nice things to other people. The gospel he presented to Nathaniel as well as to us requires us a process to decide. Is this man the one? Is he the son of God? Is he the king of Israel and now the king of the world? This means that we have to acknowledge that we need a savior. And you see, this is part of the problem with this whole conundrum. We have to acknowledge that we are in need that we need to have a king in our life that is not us, but that is Jesus. If Jesus rose from the dead, which he did, even Philip was an intellectual and Nathaniel was too, they processed this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then all bets are off. The world is no longer the same and we are confronted with the question, what will we do with this Jesus of Nazareth? What will we do with him? His offer is open. The gift is free. He offers himself to you. He offers himself to me. If you have never once considered this Jesus and you are sitting here today, I want to challenge you. Consider him. Consider him. We'll give you a Bible on the way out. But I challenge you, consider him. Don't toss him by the roadside because nothing good can come from that book or this place called Nazareth. And if you're struggling as a believer to make sense of the things that don't make sense, that's okay. We don't need to understand everything. The things that we don't understand we can believe because the things that we do understand are believable.